this presentation, we will explore the equine skeleton in relation to equitation. The equine skeleton is adapted for long distance grazing of long duration, suspension of the weighty contents of the gut, and for instantaneous cursorial movement at explosive acceleration to gallop from relative immobility as a survival mechanism to escape predation or spooking. The skull is a sophisticated food processor. It's comparatively very heavy and in equitation, its position can influence how load is distributed through the thorax and pelvis. It has a dual purpose of initiating, controlling and maintaining balance of the stride in a cantilever mechanism. The highly flexible nuchal ligament attaches to the cranium and continues along the dorsal thoracic spine as the substantial, largely inflexible supraspinous ligament. So it's in two sections to connect fix and stabilize the minimally mobile dorsal spinous processes of the thoracic and lumbar spine through its range of motion of lateral flexion, dorsiflexion, ventriflexion and rotation, which is lateral flexion, dorsiflexion, ventriflexion, and rotation. Additionally, when the head is lowered in grazing or feeding, the nuchal and supraspinous ligaments progressively tension and draw the dorsal spinous processes cranially in this direction to raise and flatten the thoracic spine. In contrast, when the head is raised and the back is loaded by a rider, it can readily hyperextend in response. This. With all limbs contacting the ground, this structure is closed kinetic chain. In contrast, the head and neck is open kinetic chain. It does not touch the ground and support of which is aided by the nuchal ligament together with a deep cervicothoracic joint to inhibit excess movement at the base. It's relatively stable with a leg in each corner except for the overhang of a weighty head and neck, although this is used for balance. The lower limbs are comparatively lightweight for speed and the radius and ulna are fused for elbow joint stability at speed. An important characteristic of the skeleton in relation to equitation is rate of closure of the epiphyseal growth plates. Immature skeletons are highly vulnerable and you can see from this chart that different regions of the body are skeletally mature at varying times. And it's clear that horses below three to four years of age are not suited to overloading of their joints with the unnatural activity of equitation. They evolved to sprint for approximately a quarter of a mile to escape predation without a rider on their backs. 
closure of the vertebrae are not complete until five and a half to eight years. Therefore, we need to take a careful look at what loads are put on the vertebrae, not just rider weight, but the forces of transitions, head carriage, jumping, plus compensatory gait when the young horse is worked. And these are vertebrae with the growth plates here, here, and this is the two year old. Very vulnerable structure. And here is the first lumbar, this one. And you can see that they're open. In particular, I stated in the first presentation that the bones and their related joints were merely passive structures requiring soft tissue to function usefully. This structure needs support of well-conditioned muscles and other soft tissue structures in order to maintain its integrity. Young horses can fatigue readily as they progress through their fitness training and it's acute fatigue that will cause the muscles to compromise joint function, removing proper support in the process. Let's take a look at the equine skeleton in motion, in particular the structures the rider and saddle will load onto. And we'll look at this in more detail in a later presentation. So lots of movement through the equine skeleton when the muscles are at work. Mobility and stability are biomechanically competing requirements for the component parts of the skeleton. And this means that the more mobile the structure is, the less stable it is. So in the human, for example, our arms have a much greater range of motion compared with our legs and our shoulder joints can dislocate much more readily than our hip joints. The saddle must be stable to buffer the rider's weight against the horse's back. With reference to skeletal conformational proportion, many believe that there are formulae that can predict optimal biomechanical advantage. Whilst there is a lot of truth in this, there are other characteristics which dictate optimal performance, such as behavior and athleticism. Olympian sprinter Hussein Bolt does not possess the accepted physical attributes of a sprinter. He's far too tall to be biomechanically capable of sprinting, so the textbooks tell us. And at six foot five, his legs are too long to accelerate as fast as they do. So there has to be other important factors involved and of greater significance than 
the potential determined by conformation is that geometrically well-structured and coordinated components forming the whole will perform better and for longer than those that are impaired. So it doesn't matter how much potential there is if the structure is flawed. There are approximately 50 separate components of the horse's back to become restricted or injured. And that's just under the saddle panels. That's a lot of potential for poor performance if normal range of motion for each and every one of these joints is compromised by the load of saddle and rider. So there are a pair of rib joints, a pair of facet joints and the main bodies of the intervertebral joints. So under the saddle region, a pair of rib joints in here, one each side, facet joints here, one each side, and the main vertebral body. Five per segment, and the saddle sits on approximately 10 segments and 10 vertebrae. So the saddle has a large role to play to buffer the effects of the rider against those 50 joints. I'll touch on the subject of posture here in relation to the skeleton, but we'll explore that in more depth in another presentation. Recall that bones are unstable without the soft tissue dynamics. And looking at these side profiles, can we assume that posture is entirely conformational? No, of course not. The Dunn is a fit, young, carefully produced riding club all-rounder with excellent muscle balance and a related good square base of support. The second example is a tall, moderately fit young horse that had failed to clear a gate as a two-year-old that he jumped. His back end had been suspended on that gate for some time before he was freed from it. And the signs are clearly still there on the back end. You can see how he's camped out behind because there's some sort of shortening happening here. The third horse is another young horse with what looks like a weak, immature posture like that which could be expected in an unridden horse. The fourth is a six-year-old Irish draft with good square posture. The fifth is a horse in its twenties and still ridden, but with a narrow base of support. You can see how much the head perches out in front of it. And the sixth horse is the same horse as the one above. One hour after a myofascial and manipulation treatment session that I performed on him. So this is a good example of what's possible before anyone completely condemns a horse for its performance potential based on its cold confirmation. In the next presentation, we will look at locating the thoracolumbar joint for saddle fit checking.